Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, good morning, everyone. We're here for oral argument in Magnus L.D. McLeod versus Muggy on Air Park, Inc., CV 220012. Um, as you know, we record and live stream these proceedings, so please give your name when you stand up to introduce your argument. You each have 20 minutes per side, although you're not required to use all your time. We do require that you keep track of your own time and that if you want to um, save some remaining minutes, you're responsible for keeping track of that. As you notice, Judge Campbell is not with us here, but she is watching the live stream. We have conferenced the case um, prior to oral argument with Judge Campbell, and we also both have our tablets here, so if she has any questions she wants us to ask, we'll make sure and get to those um, in due course. As I said, keep in mind we have read all of your briefing, we've studied the record, and of course have conferenced the case. So with that, counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Presiding Judge Bailey and members of the court, and may it please the court, my name is Jeff Proper. I am the attorney for the appellant, Magnus McLeod, in this case. I would, and seated to, or stand, seated to my left is uh, Michael Carber, who's my paralegal. He's the keeper of my records. Uh, if I need him, he is here for that purpose. Um, I want to reserve five minutes for rebuttal in this case, so I'll use 15 minutes for the main argument. This case began a couple of years ago and before the advent of the most recent Supreme Court opinion in Calway. Of the arguments that we've presented for appeal, there's three of them that if we have enough time, we'll talk about in my uh, opening argument, and they deal with Calway, which is the first issue I'd like to discuss. And then they deal with two prongs of ARS section 33-1817. The first one will deal with the interplay between A1 and A2. And the second one will deal with the effect of just A1. The factual background I'm sure the court is aware of and it's set forth in the briefs and there's not a lot of discussion. I just think it's important to note in this case that before uh, Mr. McLeod bought uh, Track G, uh, which is the subject of the dispute in this case. He did an extensive background check with both the public records as well as the records of the, uh, the association to determine that he was able to purchase and live in the tracked hangar uh, that he bought, which at the time he bought it had a completed guest house inside of it as permitted by the CCNRs. So, counsel, so, since you're going into the facts, does Callaway say that whether uh, the CCNRs provided notice, adequate notice, is a question of fact? Are we supposed to get into that? Well, it's an objective standard as set forth in the Callaway opinion. Uh, but it's in light of the surrounding circumstances. So I think it's important just by way of background, whether or not there's a factual dispute about, the, about what he did, I don't think there is. But I just think it's important to note that before this man bought Track G and decided that he was gonna reside in it, he did his homework. Whether or not that's relevant under Calway. But even if he hadn't done his homework, it's really not relevant, is it? Because we're looking at whether the C the original CCNRs gave notice to anyone, whether did they did homework or did not do homework, whether they should expect to have had the temporal change that was made in these CCNRs regarding guest homes. Generally, I agree with you, Your Honor, but the case law, the cases, and I think Calway says in light of the surrounding circumstances, so I think that there is a, a fair statement to be made. But I don't, I don't want to argue the point about whether or not you should or shouldn't consider those facts. I just bring it up as by way of sort of minimal background because I think the inquiry in this case lives and dies based upon the original CCNRs, what they say, and whether or not the proposed amendment uh, complies first with Calway because if you resolve the amendment in this case, in favor of the appellant, you really don't need to reach the other issues. Um, and so I want to- And that was one of my questions, because this, this kitchen facilities issue, um, I'm just not sure that um, you raise it in your opening 
Did you raise it in your opening brief to the Superior Court, that whole kitchen facilities? And I wasn't really following it as well as maybe I should have, the difference between how they flipped the wording and whether that had an effect on on your client's ability to have that in the hangar home. Well, the kitchen facilities was, uh, the, the play between guest houses and guest quarters was clearly part of the ALJ proceedings. Right. The, the ALJ decided that she could not consider at that time the Dreamland analysis to whether or not the amendment fails under Dreamland, and she only considered whether it failed under uh, 33-18-17-A-1 and, and or A-1 and A-2. But didn't, but didn't Appley, uh, in their um, answering brief, concede that the amendment doesn't restrict your client from having a kitchen? The issue based upon the amendment is not whether we can have a kitchen. What's interesting is there's a, I believe it's a December 2017 letter, which is part of the record that they served Mr. McLeod before the amendment went into effect, right. where they told him you can only live there temporarily and you can't have a kitchen. Okay. So the association, the members, or whoever delivered that notice to my client took the position that you couldn't have a kitchen no matter what. I think that the appellee takes the position on appeal that whether you have a guest house or whether you have a guest quarters, you can have a kitchen. But that flies in the face of the original CCNRs, which used very specifically different terminology for guest houses and guest quarters, right. and specifically attached to the use of the word guest quarters without kitchen facilities. Right. So okay. the declarant in this case intended to distinguish between guest houses and guest quarters. The amendment didn't change that, although the amendment, when it flipped the guest house, guest quarters, at least with respect to the tracks, said that you can have a guest quarters on a lot of 30,000 square feet or greater and didn't say whether it was with or without kitchen facilities. But to be consistent with the original declaration, there was a distinguishing element between those two terms and that related to uh, whether you could have a kitchen facility. Can I just ask a precursor question? Is it the original party's intent as we see some case law um, tell us, or is it the original CCNR's plain language that we should be um, analyzing for what the, should that control whether the amendment was foreseeable? I think you have to start with the language of the original CCNR's because the Calway case said it's based upon, it's a notice and reasonableness standard, which is a foreseeability standard, at least with respect to notice. But doesn't Calway also cite other cases that say it's the original intent of the CCNRs that should Calway, have an effect on our analysis? No. Calway, I think, very clearly says it's the CCNRs in effect at the time the owner buys the property. Though that would determine the reasonable expectation of the owner. So it's not the reasonable expectation of an original buyer of a lot in this air park in 1994, 1995, it's the reasonable expectation of the party who bought it with the CCNRs then in place. In this case, it happens to be the same. It's the original CCNRs. There was an amendment, uh, First Amendment done in 1994, which isn't relevant to the discussion today. We're really dealing with the original CCNRs. So with respect to the facts of this case, you're correct that the CCNRs that we have to start with are the original ones to determine what the intent right. of the Right, and I'm just was. pointing to, in Calway, they cite Armstrong for the proposition that because covenants originate in contract, the primary purpose of a court when interpreting a covenant is to give effect to the original intent of the parties with any doubt resolved against the validity of the restriction, and that's at paragraph 16 of Calway. Correct. So that's why I was asking you about the difference, how we should look at it between intent and language. Well, I, I think that e under Calway, I think it's, it seems to me, my, my opinion under Calway, different maybe than yours, but my opinion is that Calway says you have to take a look at the restrictions and any amendments that were in place at the time the owner bought his property. Yeah, and I'm not and, challenging that. I yeah, agree with you. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, Council, so the original CCNRs uh, used the term 
guest quarters. Is that right? Yes. So uh, doesn't the word guest in guest quarters um, connote something less than permanent resident occupation? Well, that certainly is Apelli's position in this case to leapfrog from the use of the word guest to the fact that you can flip-flop guest houses and guest quarters to tell a, an owner such as Mr. McLeod in this, in this case that there's things he now can't do in his, in his tract, in his parcel of property that he bought that he could have done immediately before the amendment was put in place. And they want to separate guest from house and guest from quarter to say, take a look at the right. definition of guest. I, I understand that argument. Why, why is it wrong? Well, because I think that the use of guest house and guest quarters denotes the structure, if it's an independent structure, that it's an ancillary building. It's an ancillary structure on a property. If you, I think we've given you the zoning code for the county in which this property is, and it talks about guest houses uh, and guest quarters, and, and they're simply the, the type of structure, if it's an independent structure, that is on a property. So you have your house, and then you have a guest house. And I, I think it's fair to say that people that have guest houses do all kinds of things with them uh, that are non-temporary. They rent them on a long-term, full-time basis. They have friends and relatives and grandparents and children that come home from college that live there on a full-time basis. So the fact that you use the word guest in here does not imply that it is limited to a temporary use of the property. So, so the word guest you're, you're saying is a, is a noun that is, uh, uh, has no sort of time or temporal component, and it could also be called a mother-in-law suite uh, that somebody lives in permanently. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't tell you whether it's permanent or temporary. It, it, it's it, just that a, it's for a guest. Could, well, it's a guest house or a guest quarters. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be for a guest. So let me give you an example, okay, because I think this is really important in distinguishing between guest house, guest quarters, and what they did in this case, which is not only flipping guest house and guest quarters for tracks, but it's implying that four-month limitation on the occupancy of either a guest house or a guest quarters. And that is that what happens to somebody that has a guest house or a guest quarters, and they have elderly people that live there who need full-time care? And they have a caregiver that is there on a full-time basis and attends to whoever it is within the main structure that needs help. This amendment, first of all, says you can't put that person in a guest house, which means you can't put that person in a house where they can have a kitchen and provide for their own meals on a regular basis. And more importantly, it says that that person can only live there four months out of the year, any person can only live there only four months out of the year, which means that eight months out of the year, whoever's living in there has to leave. Right. And, I, and, and Mr. Popper, I think we can all think of scenarios that would be outside of the four months that would be perfectly reasonable as a homeowner to have, but I think the question before us is whether this language should have put people on notice that that could have been a further restriction as the guest houses were already being restricted as to size and kitchens and should that, that language have given notice to an owner that they could have had further restrictions? The, um, the simple answer is no. What? Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. But the simple answer is no. And the reason is, in this case, they flipped. They did two things. But let's talk about the first prong, which is they flipped for the tracks, guest houses and guest quarters. So that means that, that when you bought, when Mr. McLeod bought his lot, he was entitled to and had in his tract a fully functional and operational guest house. He added to it when he moved in. He was permitted by the county. He was approved by the HOA to have this guest house inside of his hangar as specifically permitted under the CCNRs. All of a sudden, they make a change which says, no, <laughs> not anymore. You know, now you got to take your kitchen out because you can only have a guest quarter in your hangar. Now, 
I don't believe that there is, by any stretch, you can read the original CCNRs in this case, under which Mr. McLeod bought, and find that he could have expected that the association, based upon a vote of 75% of its members, or approved, and we'll get into this maybe, or approved by the association, could tell him he can no longer have a, a guest house, he can only have a guest quarters. Well, and when you, when, when you have your break, I'd like you to look at the answering brief at PDF 42, just to, because I think there's a concession there that the kitchen issue is off the table, and so I don't want to spend too much more time on it. Um, but I did want to ask you a couple questions um, about some of the other issues because I don't want to miss them. Uh, it, it, what is the appropriate remedy here? If you win, what is what is the last paragraph of our decision say? As far as unwinding where we are from Judge Kiley back to the Department of Real Estate. Well, there's two different things that you can do depending on whether you come off under Calway only or whether you come off under 33-1817-A2. If you come off just under Calway, then what you do in this case, if possible, is to blue line the amendment to make it conform to the reasonable expectations of the owners in, in light of the other things that are in Calway. Because Calway contains a few other prongs that are, that are important. And so then are we setting aside Judge Kiley's order and then ordering the department to find for you, find against them on your competing petitions, and that's the end? Under 33-1817-A2, the answer to that is yes, because that would invalidate the amendment as a whole. Okay, Under Calway, if you can make the amendment... Um, if we blue penciled the amendment, you can, then what you are we doing can, with Judge Kiley the ALJ and to well, you would instruct the ALJ to adopt the blue lined amendment as the amendment that it then would approve. The question becomes who would be the prevailing party in that case? In a sense, we would because we objected to the guest house guest quarter flip, and we objected to the four month limitation so she would then find in favor of the the applicant in this case mr mcleod on his 019 petition uh, and, and by the way even if the appellee in this case concedes that you can have a kitchen in a guest quarters I, i'm not sure that that ends the discussion because there clearly was intended by the applicant, by the declarant, to have a difference between guest houses and guest quarters. And I'm not sure just because in his answering brief he concedes that, that Mr. McLeod can have his kitchen now in his guest quarters. What does that do between the declarant's use of guest houses and guest quarters. Does it now blend them? Because if everybody can have a kitchen, then what's the difference between a guest house and a guest quarters? So I'm not sure that, that the admission in the brief that you can have that really is the beginning and end of the discussion because it flies in the face of what the declarant intended in the original CCNRs by defining those terms differently. Okay. I don't so, know if you want to still reserve time. Oh, I have two minutes and 17 seconds. So I got to my other two arguments. I'll reserve the remaining two minutes and 12 seconds. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Council, when you're ready. the court. My name is Greg Stein and I represent Mogollon Air Park in this case. I, I want to initially say it was kind of towards the end of Mr. Proper's presentation that I think we benefit from having Judge Kiley's detailed rulings and the rationale. Um, I think that's a reason why he's on this court at this point and we would ask just as a general matter that the court accept and adopt uh, 
Judge Kiley's what we believe well-reasoned rationale and affirm the underlying rulings. Uh, most importantly in this in this case, Calway doesn't apply. And I understand Calway came out after uh, Judge Kiley issued his under advisement ruling. It came but, out just a few days before, I think. Oh, uh, he, well, he before he, his reconsideration ruling. Correct. Yeah, right. and I apologize. His his under advisement ruling from November two thousand twenty one. Right. The, the detailed right. ruling, but but yes, um, and he addressed the the Calway issue in his in his decision regarding the motion for reconsideration more as a, as a waiver issue rather than getting to the substance of Calway. But so why doesn't Calway apply here? Well. I don't believe, well, Calway applies. Uh, oh, I thought that was your opening statement. Was no, Calway so I apologize. So, so Calway doesn't apply, be, and Judge Kiley already fortuitously, frankly, uh, in his under advisement ruling from November 2021, why this amendment, uh, even if kind of, I guess, foreseeing what the Supreme Court would say in Calway a few months later, why this amendment nevertheless was reasonable and foreseeable under the circumstances. Um, you know, the other, the other reasons as well, I don't think Mr. Proper was able to get to, to them, uh, would be that the party stipulated that the amendment at issue satisfied the standard of ARS Section 33-18-17-A1, you know, assuming you know, so, so, Counsel, you, you, you agree that Calway applies, you're just saying it's satisfied? Correct. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and ARS Section 3318.17.A1, um, the, the party stipulated that the, that the amendment satisfied the requirements of the declaration. It, it received the at least 75% approval. Um, A, A2 does not apply, you know, for the reasons we've addressed in the brief. I think the the, the attempts to characterize the amendment as uniform in application because it applies to all of the lots, um, but non-uniform in effect, um, I think just misstates what we've addressed in the briefing under the Riley and the La Esperanza cases. Those cases specifically said lot you know, 27 or whatever is exempted from a two-story restriction or does not have to have certain types of siding on the house or in La Esperanza, this section of the community can be used for commercial purposes, where it, whereas it wasn't before. That's not at all what, we're, what happened in this case. So turning to Callaway then, can you tell us in, in bullet points or however you want to do it, what, what in the record or what in the, I guess here in the, in the CCNRs, shows that uh, <clears throat> that the restriction at issue was, uh, is it reasonably foreseeable uh, from the outset? Yeah, and, and I, I think I have four specific points. Um, paragraph two of the original CCNRs, and it's also addressed uh, not in as great a depth throughout the rest of the CCNRs, uh, but it's also addressed, I believe, in paragraph four and five, that this, the the, the single-family residential structures are only uh, to be constructed on lots. Um, it, it distinguishes between what are defined as a single-family residential structures and what before were guest quarters on lots and what were guest houses on the, the tracks. Um, as well, it's clear that the language that is used, that these are ancillary structures. These are not intended to be the main structures on the property. Um, Kind of, I don't think it's necessary to get into the facts, but, but Mr. Proper addressed, Mr. McLeod looked into the CCNRs and whether he could you know, exercise this use under the CCNRs before purchasing. He clearly didn't review it very carefully because he didn't even purchase a lot prior to purchasing the tract. And it's clear that you have to own a lot before you purchase a tract. Okay, that's not really an issue though, right. is it? Because but, he did purchase a lot after the fact, and nobody's brought that correct. to the court's attention at any level. So, okay. Correct. Uh, but I think it also shows you, you can't just own a tract uh, in and of itself. You have to own a separate residential structure. So the thought that an owner would ever use the guest house or the guest, quarter, guest quarters for, for full-time permanent occupancy. Is it that it's the owner that's using it? I mean, and... You know, I told Mr. Proper to stop giving me examples of ways that you could imagine wanting to use a guest house, but, you know, there are so many. I mean, if, if a guest house was meant for an elderly mother, a college student home, if you wanted to spend six months in Arizona and six months somewhere else, this precludes that. So when I go through those myriad of things that would say, 
in this case, I understand what you're saying. This is kind of the extreme that an owner is using it full time as his residence. But what is the difference between his mother coming out for six months and staying there or five months or four and a half months that's now being precluded? How is that reasonable in light of the language of the original CCNRs? You know, I, th I think it's reasonable for the, <clears throat> for the reasons I had said before, you know, uh, getting through those factors. But the last one, really, the temporal limitation. If we had the original CCNRs that said you can construct a residential structure on your property and you can you can construct any other ancillary buildings that you desire for residential purposes as well. And there's nothing that indicates that these structures are to be some sort of temporal limitation. They're for guest pur use purposes, all of that. But isn't a guest house for someone to stay in? I mean, it's not an outbuilding. It's not a septic tank. It's not, it's a place where someone is supposed to stay. And the question is, if you have a place where someone's supposed to stay, and that's the extent of what the CCNR say, then why isn't it re why is it reasonable to later have something that does address temporal limitations? Well, I think that what what Calway says is there has to at least be notice that a restriction exists. And you can have an amendment that comes along later on and clarifies, corrects an error, fills in a gap. Reading what's in the original CCNRs, could the association, could the air park have pre precluded uh, or enforced a four month um, maximum occupancy of the aircraft storage hangars prior to the, the adoption of the amendment? Probably not. But what it did is it at least put people on notice, and, and as we mentioned, an objectively reasonable person, that these separate buildings, uh, you know, there's, there's in, in my view, some sort of temporal limitation. I don't believe, you know, we can just refer to it as a guest house and guest quarters. I mean, we, we included the definitions, and, and we used dictionary definitions in the briefing as well that talked about a guest house and it being used as, you know, a, a lodging for guests on a temporary basis, you know, as a bed and breakfast, all of that. It just so, it didn't seem to be a temporal, it would seem to be a temporal limitation. All right, so let's break this down. Uh, uh, the words guest house, those just nouns, right? <clears throat> right? Correct. And there's no adverb or time or adjective modifier. It's just, there's just guest house, right? That's Correct. In quarters. And so even if, a guest is staying there temporarily, why couldn't you stack guests back to back to back, which would have a full-time occupancy, but still only guests? Well, I think it's not necessarily just the language guest house and guest quarters, but it's in conjunction with the other provisions. That it's, again, we talked about the ancillary. Is that an argument you made below, that it, that it should be read with the other provisions of this, the original CCNRs? An argument that was made to the Superior Court? I believe yeah. so. I, I'd have to go back and look at That we should read all of these together because I, I just don't recall in your briefing that you asked us to do that. I mean, we addressed that the, the language of the original CCNRs that, that clearly defined um, the distinction between single family residential structures and these these separate guest quarters and, and guest hangars. And I think read in conjunction, I think one of the, one of the, the major factors is to also point to you you cannot own these tracks without owning a lot as well um the the understanding would always be that an owner would reside in their single family residential structure um their you know there was a, the the language guest house and and guest quarters like i said before an amendment came along to clarify and refine that and so maybe we couldn't have relied upon it um, prior to the adoption of the amendment, but I think it was certainly reasonable and foreseeable to change that, and I think owners had notice of that prior to the adoption of the amendment that that was certainly a possibility. And I, I, I don't think this issue has been addressed, but I, I'll just say I, I don't think the Supreme Court with Calway, I think some of the language in Calway hasn't necessarily done us favors in, in applying and addressing the validity of underlying amendments. Um, there's language in the Calway case that talks about that, and it cites with approval to Powell. 
but also at the same time, it says that um, re that restrictive covenants are construed narrowly and against the free use of the land. I don't, frankly, I don't believe that that Calway, the Supreme Court in Calway, intended to throw Powell to the wind um, and eliminate a well-reasoned Supreme Court decision from 2006, just 16 years later, especially when we consider kind of the, the chronology of land use regulations. It, it's always been the older historical view that land use regulations are construed narrowly and in favor of free use of the land. That, that was going back hundreds of years up to you know, the, late, the late 20th century. In 2006, there was a change with Powell that these restrictive covenants are to be interpreted just like any other contract, that we're going to try to discern the intent of the parties, and we do that from the plain language that's used, the surrounding circumstances, and the purpose for which, for which the restrictive covenants have been adopted. I don't believe that utilizing previously the old method of interpreting restrictive covenants changing that method in 2006 and then 16 years later coming full circle and saying we're going back to the old method I, I don't believe that that is frankly what the Supreme Court was intending in Calway that, that has kind of left us with an unworkable standard at this point I think the way we really have to reconcile these cases is to look and see <clears throat> when it comes to the amendment in question um, is there, is there language in the original CCNRs that we can point to, that we can tether to the original restriction, this new restriction, and say, you know what, this, this owner should have been on notice of this, this is reasonable and foreseeable. Um, I, I don't, and I think that when we get over that hump, um, what, what happened here is that the air park, uh, well, the grassroots owners who did it, um, as Mr. Proper may address, the grassroots owners who did it adopted a, what frankly is a very conservative interpretation of, of temporary occupancy. You know, if they had said that owners could only use it for one day or one week, or guests could only use it for one day or one week, it would probably be very difficult for me to stand up here and say, Mr. McLeod, when he's purchasing, or other owners when they're purchasing, they have these guest houses and they can use them for no more than one day or one week at a time. That would, that would frankly be pretty difficult. But I think the way we reconcile Powell and Calway is if, if, we're ta if, there's, any legit, if there's legitimate doubt or there are close calls, we have to, we have to um, construe that narrowly and in favor of the free use of the land. But when an amendment here is adopted and it is conservative and you know, I think frankly furthers what are the majority of owners reasonable uh, expectations and what would be foreseeable that that should be upheld you know it's kind of the same example that I've used in in the underlying briefing when it came to short-term rental um, purposes or short-term rental restrictions you have 1970s era condominium associations that I represent a lot you'll have you'll have provisions in the CCNRs that prohibit leasing for hotel or transient purposes well what does that mean it means different things to different people Without an amendment that clarifies what that provision means, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, for an association to enforce a weekend rental provision or a week or two weeks. But under Calway, is it reasonable or foreseeable that that association may later adopt an amendment to impose a two-week minimum rental term? But under these under this amendment, just bringing any kind of temporal limitation, whether it was one day or 11 and a half months, isn't the question for us whether someone who bought under those original CCNR should have known that a temporal limitation on their property, whatever it was, whether they saw it as reasonable or unreasonable, was not, they were not put on notice that somehow they would be limited in any way as to how long someone could stay in their guest house. Again, whether it's a family member, a caregiver, whether they have multiple people coming in for five months at a time, isn't that our question, is whether we should, they should have been on notice that any temporal limitation would be addressed, whether it was something that you term reasonable or unreasonable. I'm not sure we're digging so far into the facts to say, well, if it was a week, it wasn't, but if it was nine months, that's fine. 
our job, I think, and, t and that's why I'm asking you, tell me if I'm wrong, is that they should have been on notice that any temporal limitation could have been imposed based on what the language of the original CCNR said. And, and, and I agree. And I, and I think that the language of the original CCNRs did put a reasonable owner on notice, an objectively reasonable owner. We, we have the way, as I've said before, we have the way that the structures were defined with the guest houses and the guest houses and the guest quarters. You can't own these separate and apart from a lot. You they're ancillary to the existing residential structure. Um, it, it seems to me based on based on the language and, and differentiating, these are clearly two separate types of, of property ownerships that owners were on those that these these were different things that uh, and I think the the plain language, I mean we're not even using legal or black's law uh, dictionary definitions to define guest house. We're just using plain, you know, Merriam Webster's. Um, uh, I think the Oxford Dictionary, dictionary.com. I, I think looking at those, that the, the language of the CCNRs would have put an owner on notice that you can't, you can't live within your aircraft storage hangar that has an airplane in, you know, the, the large garage door. You can't live in an upstairs uh, 400 square foot area. Um, I, I think that owners were, you know, had reasonable notice based on that language, and it was foreseeable that the association would later adopt this amendment based on that, based on that plain language. And I have about three minutes left. Um, I don't think, you know, I, I think I understand, you know, the court is going to be addressing this primarily under Calway, um, but I don't believe that you know, if, if you go past that argument, that really any of the arguments, you know, have, have merit. I, I think many of the arguments have been waived um, and have not been preserved for, for appellate review. Um, 331817 a one uh, the party stipulated that it met the, the voting threshold required under the statute. I think that imposing some sort of, I, I think, hyper-technical restriction uh, to say that a grassroots campaign of owners cannot adopt a CCNR amendment uh, is 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 not what the legislature intended with with later changes to to 3318.17a1. And frankly, if I pointed this out in the in the answering brief, if you if you get past the point where there's no association or no no board, you're not even within the planned community statutes anymore. You have to have an association in order to adopt an amendment under the planned community statutes. So saying that there was an association or a board, so they were the ones who were required to do this, I think obfuscates uh, the plain language of 3318.17a1. Um, I think we've addressed thoroughly um, the issue between uniform application and, and uniform effect. This, this clearly applied uniformly to the lots and the tracks. It had a, it had a, a, a potentially a, a disproportionate effect on people who wanted to utilize uh, guest houses or guest quarters for, for, you know, temporary purposes. And I, I didn't really understand some of the arguments regarding abuse of discretion for denying the motion for reconsideration. I, I don't think that argument was fleshed out. And I think, you know, Judge Kiley was well within his rights to um, impose attorney's fees under 12.341.01 and 12.349. Uh, but in any event, you know, to the extent the court is considering the arguments in relation to 12.349, you know, Mr. McLeod has only challenged Judge Kiley's award under 12349. He hasn't even challenged it under 12341.01, which should be affirmed uh, because it hasn't been preserved, I think, for appellate review. Um, so I have about 40 seconds left. If you have any further questions, I'd be happy to address. Anything else? Okay. I don't see anything from Judge Campbell, so thank you so much. Thank you. If I could buy some extra time, I would like to do so, but I know I can. Uh, first of all, if you read the statement, the stipulated facts, that the appellee continues to kind of misrepresent, it nowhere says that we agree that A1 applies to this particular amendment. And I think your briefing made clear what your position was on that. Yeah. Uh, it's also, I think, important to note that there is no requirement under the CCNRs that you build a house on a lot as opposed to a tract. You can buy a lot and you can buy a tract and you can build your 
guest house inside of your aircraft storage hangar and live there and you don't need to build spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a house on a lot ccnr specifically say that the um the ancillary structures in this case are specifically under the original CCNR supposed to be inside of the aircraft storage hangar. The only structure that's allowed outside of an aircraft storage hangar other than a single family residence is on a lot of 30,000 square feet or more and then you can have a separate guest quarters. No longer the case. Uh, and I think that what the ALJ and Judge Kiley both missed, and I want to make sure that we don't miss it here, is that this amendment applied non-uniformly to the nine tracks E through M. They are the only ones whose rights were affected by this amendment with respect to the flip between guest houses and guest quarters. No other lot was affected by that amendment. That brings into play A2. Without Mr. McLeod's signature, the entire amendment must, under those circumstances, fail. I don't want to beat up Kylie anymore. We've already done, I think, a good job of fleshing that out. I do just want to touch for the 30 seconds or, well, no, I have one second left, so That's I'm done. That's right. Thank you. And thank you both for your arguments. We'll take the matter under advisement and issue our decision in due course, and we'll stand in recess while we reset for the next argument. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.